I hope that the Lord's grace and peace have been with you this week as we continue on with the video series. And I pray that last Sunday was a fantastic church day for you. I know it was for me and the other people that were on the platform. It's just so good to see everybody out there at, uh, at this time because we, we miss each other. But this week, I'm going to give you a reading from Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you, Lord. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself is the rock eternal. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, our Father, thank you for everything that you have given us in these times that we've been through. Lord, we ask for your peace and your calm and your amazing grace during this time when everybody's just kind of in a limbo and not knowing what to do, where to go, who to see, not being able to go up to anybody within so many feet and it's just a different world, Lord, but that's okay. We're still in your world that you made, not ours, yours. Lord, we just love you. We just want to just, just adore you today. We want to lift you up and just say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do. And Lord, we just can't tell you enough how much we appreciate your son that came to this earth, who gave his life and was risen and taken to heaven with you and sits on your right side. And he intercedes for us so that every prayer and every sin is forgiven. Oh God, thank you. And may we have a holy, holy morning with you on this beautiful day that you've created. In Jesus, your son's name we ask, amen.
good to be back with you once again. I pray God's blessing upon your lives. I hope that your week has been going good. And under the circumstances that you're still encouraged in the Lord Jesus Christ. Before we begin this morning, uh, I'd like for us to just take a few moments and to call upon the Lord and to ask for his guidance. So let us pray. Father, we thank you for this blessing that we have to come to you. What a delight it is to be in your presence. We pray that your spirit would be right here with us. Let these words, this time here together, be a time that you're speaking to us. and You help us to listen, to obey, guide our steps, I ask, and all of these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. A question uh, from former NATO Supreme Commander General Wesley Clark after the uh, towers tumbled and parts of the Pentagon were pulverized at 9-11, was asked, will we ever be the same? I'm asking the same question as we finish, as we go through this pandemic. Are we going to ever be the same? You know, I think it's going to be sad, and the worst thing that could happen would be for us to have not grown through all of uh, this and still be the same. I'd like to take just a few moments to look to God's Word to help those of us, all of us, to know how to keep working through what we're going through. Most of us are tired. Some of us are very anxious. Some of us have really struggled through this. Some of us were getting by just fine. But I believe that God's Word is very important for us in times like this. I invite you to look into the book of Psalms, Psalm 46, in fact, and I want us to see together what God's Word has to say to us. Now, it's interesting that in this Psalm 46, there are three words that uh, are at the end of verse 3, at the end of verse 7, and at the end of verse 11. And this word is the word selah. Most versions of the Bible don't really attempt to translate Selah. They just put it in its natural form, Selah, in the Hebrew. We know from the title of this psalm that it was designed to be sung. And so, therefore, maybe we could say that Selah is that which says pause. In fact, the Septuagint, which is the earliest Greek translation of the Old Testament, translates sila as intermission. The idea is to get us to take a breath in order to reflect and to remember. I like what the Amplified Version uh, renders it. Pause, calmly think about that. In addition, I believe that sila is thought to be rendered from two Hebrew words translated as to praise and to lift up. Perhaps the singers are to be encouraged to pause and think about what they have just sung and to praise God from their hearts. Now, I find it rather interesting because this word is also in the imperative, meaning it's a command. We are commanded to stop and to uh, look back at what we just read and to uh, pause and to praise him. The best way I think that Selah uh, can be thought of is in the com- a combination of, of these meanings. Put all these meanings that I've just shared together with you, and let's come up with, in the midst of our problems, why don't you and I exercise more about pausing, pivoting, and praising? Because this word appears several times, it must be important. And in this very psalm, it appears three times. So it must be critically important that we pause, pivot, and praise. So let's begin with the first section. And the first section, I want to title it, His Promise, He Is For You. So we're going to pause, pivot, and praise God at the end of this and see what it is that he has to say. Let us read God's word and what does, what does he say? God is our refuge and strength, 
a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Selah. Stop, pause, pivot. Praise the Lord for this. But what are we praising Him about? What is there that we need to praise Him? I believe that in the midst of whatever you're feeling today, God's promise is that He is our refuge, our strength, and our help. Now, notice with me. He isn't pointing you to a refuge. He's not pointing you to a strength or to a help. He is saying, I am your refuge. He himself is the refuge. He is the help. And he is the strength that we need. We need to do as the psalmist did and cry out in Psalm 142, 5. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge my portion in the land of the living. God promises to hide us in his shelter, and he can help us by his strength. He is also our very present help in trouble. Now, right now, I believe the world is experiencing a great humbling. All of the greatest and most powerful leaders in our nations including economies that just weeks ago were just booming, booming. It almost seemed unreal. It just seemed like, wow, if, why is it just now? Why couldn't it before? And so there's great things that were happening, but it has all come to a halt. The supply chains disrupted. Churches are now meeting virtually. Hospitals are bracing for large numbers of new cases, and the grocery store shelves are empty of all of its uh, foods and necessities. And please, will somebody tell me why toilet ta paper? <laughs> oh, all of this is a bad situation that we find ourselves. It takes us out of the normal. In fact, it even takes us out of a control and we feel like this whole thing has been upended. This virus, like a pestilence, seems to be stalking the entire world, not just here in South Carolina, not in the United States, but around the globe. It seems to be an invisible uh, in the darkness of night, and it feels like we can't get away from it, doesn't it? The psalmist is saying, when our security is suddenly gone, we're to seek refuge in God himself. When we're stripped from everything that supposedly brings us security, we need to know that God can be trusted. It's easy to trust God when he does what we want him to. But what about God when all of a sudden all of this is taken away from us. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, I believe it is beautifully put, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Folks, we've got to understand. We need to pause, pivot, and praise God that we have a refuge. What does it take to disrupt you uh, from your faith? The psalmist says, it doesn't matter. Even though the mountains are thrown into the sea, you know, it's almost the opposite of what happened at creation. It doesn't matter. Strip all of that from us. And guess what? God is still there. The second thing I'd like for us to notice is his presence. Not only his promise, but now his presence. He is with you. You have to understand that he is never very far away. Let's read his word. And what does it say to us here this morning? There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. 
God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Pause. Pivot. And praise God. You see, God's promise, God promises shelter when we seek him. Fortunately, we don't have to run very far because he's right here beside us. Notice now that verse 4 paints a picture that is so easily for us to miss. So I want you to follow closely. First of all, the city of God is Jerusalem. And while it is a very beautiful city, it didn't have a river running through it like other major cities and countries of that day. But Jerusalem had something even better, the very presence of God. And it is also noticed there in the title, Most High. Most High is uh, Elion, which refers to God as the highest of all. He is sovereign, he is supreme, and he is present with us. God's grace flows like a river to bring gladness and joy to his people. And while the oceans are raging and foams, while God's presence is depicted as a calm and gently flowing stream. God's favor is often denoted by as a river. In Psalm 36, 8, they feast on the abundance of your house and you give them drink from the river of your delights. God's presence is with his people. And one of the central truths in scriptures, we find this over and over again. Now notice in verse 5, God is in the midst of her. And in verse 7, declares that the Lord of hosts is with us. Did you know that the Lord of hosts is with us? It comes from the root word Emmanuel. And we all know what Emmanuel is, is God with us. So this means that when we put our faith in Jesus, we have God with us all the time. Now, going back to verse 5, God will help her at the break of day. And no matter how bad things seem to get, you know, it is always said that it's the darkest right before the dawn. And when it seems like it's just about to just go bad, God always comes through and gives us the very help that we need. Rage is the same word used in verse 3, the roar of the waters, chaos, agitated like waves, things that are now bad. We can count on his presence in the midst of the storm. Now, the Lord of hosts is with us. Here we introduce to another name for God, Jehovah Sabbath which means Lord of the Angel Armies. Now stop and think for just a moment. The Lord Almighty has the host of heaven ready to do his work. In Psalm 4, 24, verse 10, ask the question, Who is he, this King of glory, the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Sabbath, he is the king of glory, Selah. God is the king and commander over army, every army, both spiritual and earthly. He mobilizes them to accomplish his purposes. It was the promise of his presence which gave Moses peace according to Exodus 33:14. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. 
I love this verse ends. The God of Jacob is our fortress, as in verse 1. God is depicted not only as powerful, but also as a fortress that we can run to for safety. By the way, this is the text that moved Martin Luther to write the great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Now, another thing I don't want you to miss is that God, the God of Jacob. Now, I hadn't really thought of this before, and yet it's right here and it can't be missed. Jacob was known, if you'll go back and study the life of Jacob, he was a deceiver with a twisted mind and a twisted heart. And guess what? We are a lot common, com have a lot in common with Jacob. And God is saying that he is our God, the God of Jacob, the God of the deceiver, the God of the twisted mind, the God of this uh, bad heart. But now follow with me in the beauty of all of this. That God stuck with Jacob. God shaped him. God molded him into the man of faith. And he didn't stop there. He went one step further. And what did he do? He changed his name to Israel, which means Prince of God. Aren't you glad God takes the selfish sinner like us and changes us from the outside, inside out? Thank God that he is the God of Jacob. Those of us that are in a bad shape, but he wants to change us and make us different. So notice, his presence is with you. His presence is ours, and we want to not miss that. Pause, pivot, and praise. The third thing that I want us to notice is his power. He is above you. So let's read verse 8 to 11. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Stop. Pause. Pivot. And praise. What can we praise him about? What is there to be praised? We can depend on God during times like this because of his promise because of his presence, and finally because of his power. We see the heart of God in these verses. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on earth. He makes wars to cease, to end uh, at the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. And then notice how he goes from third person to to first person, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Pause, pivot, and praise him. Now, I keep coming back to the phrase, that I heard uh, some time ago. We become what we behold. So you stop and think of that. We become what we behold. And here's what I believe tells on us. You, tell, you show me what you're beholding, and I'll show you what you're going to become. It's just that simple. This verse tells us 
We are to behold the works of God, the works of the Lord. The word desolation means ruin, uh, astonishment, wasting, dismay, and horror. We have got to behold the works of the Lord, because when we behold the works of the Lord, we then will become like him. We will then become his children. I've been amazed at how people are seeking the Lord right now. You're hearing stories, even though we're hunkered down and seemingly uh, separated from each other, that there are people's lives that are being changed. Dr. Mark Job, the president of Moody Bible Institute, made this statement. Our location has changed, but our mission remains the same. I really believe that God is up to something. I believe that he is going to do something that is totally beyond our imagination. I believe that there is going to be something that is going to help us to see God is truly at work. Hasn't it felt like there's nothing that we can do to stop this virus? We have felt helpless and even hopeless. In his position as sovereign king, God is in charge. And we need to know that he is our refuge, our strength, our help in the time of need. Listen. Through death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, God has shattered sin and Satan, and he has demolished death. He has broken our bondage so we don't have to be burned by fires of hell. We have to understand that being in the presence of God is being in his refuge, experiencing his strength, and knowing that we're going to have his help. I'd like for us to pause here at this final sila, and I'd like to ask you these questions. Are you right with God? It doesn't matter what's going to happen, my friend. What is is going to be. The thing that is important is, are you ready? Are you right with God? Because if you're not, I'd like to encourage you to get ready because of the Lord Jesus Christ is coming, and we need to be ready. The next thing is, is that I hope that you're telling somebody about Jesus. I hope that you're telling them about the refuge and the strength and the help that we have. And I want to encourage you to continue to be the church. I really believe that this has been a good thing for us, because we have grown too comfortable in where we have been. And now, we need to get out and to meet people and to mingle with people. When Japan bombed, uh, when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, there was a feeling of acceleration among our enemies. But one man knew better, and that was the Japanese Admiral uh, Yamamoto, who knew that rather than victory, Japan had instead sowed the seeds for its final defeat. In his famous quote, he said, We have awakened a sleeping giant and filled him with a terrible resolve. I want to think that while this virus may indeed awaken our world, my prayer is that the sleeping giant called the church will wake up and resolve to show and share the gospel of Jesus Christ like we've never done before. In the midst of our problems, my friends, I encourage you, pause, pivot, and praise God because he is worthy of our praise. He is worthy because he has promised he is for us. He is worthy of our praise because his presence is with us. 
He is worthy to be praised because his power is inevitable. Will we be the same? I hope not. I hope that we're going to be a church that has awakened to really be the church triumphant. And I ask that God would help us and to give us the victory and the help that we need. Let's pause for a time of prayer. I'm thinking about many of you who have been going through some difficult times. There are some that I've been able to tend to. We'd be praying for uh, families with uh, that have suffered the death of loved ones. There's the sickness, and there's the discomfort of all of this that's going on, the loss of jobs, the loss of funds, and financial strains. But guess what? God is our refuge, and we've got to hang in there with him because there is no other option that will bring us any better hope than God himself. Let us pray. Lord, we bow in your holy presence, thanking you and praising you for who you are. We thank you for your faithfulness in the fact that you have constantly supplied our needs. At the right time, at the right moment, you always do the right thing. And even though we get anxious because it doesn't go according to our timepiece, you are always on time. I pray for the one who has lost a loved one. I pray for the one who is in the financial straits right now. I pray for that person who has lost their job. I pray, oh God, for that person who is really having it difficult. I pray for moms and dads <clears throat> that they have had to, in a way, really have to stay with their families and, and be closed in together. But, oh God, there may be that there would be some good things that come from this. Give us the strength that we need, and you've promised to give us the strength. Lord, we need your refuge, and we call upon that refuge. We need the very help in this very time. And Lord, you've offered that to us. Help us, O oh God, that in our daily lives we need to pause, pivot, and praise your holy name. Lord, we thank you for these things. We ask for these things. All in Jesus' name who's made it possible. We pray, amen. May God richly and abundantly bless you. And until we meet again, may he constantly be your guide. In Jesus' name, amen.